The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Feel free to take your time. All right, hi, I'm Mike Brown. I'm with the team at Arch Linux Arm, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about Linux on Arm um, and how it inter you can interface with the world. Uh, mash me button. All right, so who am I? I am not an expert, but I do know what I'm talking about sometimes. I've been working. Hit the left button. Left, 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 left. All right, so I've been working with uh, Linux since sometime around the 2.0 point something mark. It's been a while. Um, and I've been working with ARM-based device for about five years now. Um, although I have been breaking things for about 25 years, and I'm only 30. And I heart cats. Good. All right, who knows what ARM is? General raise of hands. All right, so most, most people have heard of ARM uh, from the Raspberry Pi, um, which has gotten a lot of press in the past year. Um, ARM is a kind of a chip manufacturer, or it's a chip manufacturer kind of like Intel or AMD or Motorola, but they just license the technology and it's made by different companies. A lot of them have come, uh, because they're low power, so they're actually quite ubiquitous now. I'm assuming that all of you have an ARM processor on your person in your phone. Your phone has an, if you're Android or Apple, it's running 90% chance it's running on an ARM processor. They're so ubiquitous that you can find them almost anywhere. Flip it. All right, so interfacing with the world. What do I mean? You know what an Arduino is, right? You have this Arduino, you have this thing you can do all kinds of things with, you know, flick switches, process things, you know, do little tiny things. You can't really do much with that on, you know, w with the world. You can buy pieces to add on, but it's kind of difficult and you're kind of limited in what you can do. Flip. Automate, home automation, you know, turning things on off, tracking things, data logging, and anything you want to do. Click. So, why use an ARM device? Most ARM devices are more, quite a bit more powerful, especially when you're talking about running Linux on them. Um, most of them are ARM v5 or higher. Um, so you're gonna have uh, typically anywhere from 400 megahertz all the way up to two gigahertz uh, speed with multi-core, gigabytes of memory, um, gigabytes of storage on them on a little tiny board that you can get that big. Flick. They typically run less than five watts of power, and they're fast. The Raspberry Pi on default is 700 megahertz, um, which clocks to gigahertz. The all-winner A1X, which is on the QB board, the Hackberries, the Melee A100s, the, the whole bunch of Chinese pieces made pieces, they run at gigahertz. The, big, the new BeagleBone Black is a gigahertz, and they're all cheap. And they're less than 50, a lot of them less than 50 bucks. <clears throat> so, you can do this with an Arduino. You know, you can log data, you can click things, you can send things up to the internet. Click once. Arduino. About 30 bucks, you can find cheap knockoffs for 20. One more time. But an Ethernet shield, typically around 40 bucks. So, you add the math, that's, you know, 60, 70 bucks that you can do with on an ARM PC or ARM device that you can do a lot cheaper. All right, so, secret? I still use an Arduino, and I still leave this computer on 24 seven. So I'm not power conservative. It's, I use a computer that's drawing several hundred watts of power on all the time. But hey, yeah, click it. Biggest thing in, when dealing with ARM and dealing with anything in, in computing in general is click. One more time. The right tool. I can't stress this enough. 
people come to me, I'm uh, with a team and I do a lot of support for Arch Linux Arm and we see a lot of people come in that wanted to do this, you know, they want to do clustering of Raspberry Pis, like, why would you want to do that? It's, for clustering Raspberry Pis, it's just a proof of concept. There's no real application for it whatsoever. When you can take a, you can go to Best Buy, buy three $200 PCs, stick them in a closet, and you have 10 times computing power as 400 Pis. Doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> so, a few examples of what you can, you know, uh, things that you can do for automation and stuff. You want to turn something on an hour after it gets dark. You can do that. You can do that with pretty much anything you want. You can do it with, you know, transistors and timers and build something. But a lot of times, you know, it'd be really easy to write with an Arduino. You, you know, write, hey, when the out analog read is less than one volt, wait 30 minutes and then turn the switch on. Really easy. You want to take 20 megapixel pictures and render them in Blender really fast. You're not going to do that on a Raspberry Pi. You're not going to do that on Arduino. You're going to want a big computer to do that, so it's kind of one of those things. But I want to be able to check on my cats, feed them, and make sure my fish tank isn't becoming fish stew. That's actually what I'm doing. So I did. Right. Using Raspberry Pi, which I kind of actually don't like, but we're going to just avoid that question. I started logging temperatures because I want to see how hot it got and what kind of fluctuations I got. Because one day I noticed that my fish tank was like 85 degrees, and yeah, we don't like that. Oh, and I'm a data nerd. I like data sites, and they make me happy. So here is my graph of my apartment. I did fish. Tropical fish tend to be wanting, you know, from 22 to 28 degrees centigrade. So, you know, I wanted to see. I actually peak up above 28 a couple times, and I, that's where I need a microscope. So, so this here is my ambient temperature in my apartment. The red temperature is the temperature of the water. For most people, it's kind of boring. I like it. Yeah, click it. I wanted to know, you know, there's these. I bought a couple sensors on eBay because, you know, they're cheap. I was like, oh, I can do that. And the DSA TV20s are really kind of cool. They're cheap. They're easy to work with. Um, there's Linux drivers available. You can hook them up to a GPIO on a device. You can hook them up to, I think, you do even do a parallel port if you still have one. Um, and resistor, and you got a hard drive or device that registers in uh, sys class devices. W1 something, 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 something. But there, you can get non wireless you can get a lot of different one-wire devices. That, but the ATB20s are great for data logging of temperatures. Click. So, as I break things, where do we get temperatures? So now what? Well, oops. We're using a device that's online runs Linux, and well, what can you do with any Linux computer? You can do anything you want. Uh, upload the data to Cosm. Um, if you, do anyone know what Cosm is? Uh, Cosm is a uh, logging site that you can graph data, um, you can submit your uh, temperatures. Uh, cool one was recently with the earthquakes in Japan, a lot of people were logging um, radiation data. So you can see the radiation data at someone's house over time and see where it rose or went down or still kind of cool stuff. Um, look it up. You can see me some pretty cool things with it. Email yourself when things are getting too hot or cold. Um, I had a script at one point that sent me an email and also sent me a text message with the Google SMS, uh, Google Talk plugin, you can little Perl that just kind of shoved it out and sent me a text when things were getting too hot. Or you can have it do something about it. A company called Olinex, a uh, little Bulgarian company, there's parts from DigiKey. They make some really cool kind of stuff. Automatic, er, this is the Mod IO 2, this is the Mod IO 1. Um, relays, GPIO, 
all handily done, you know, you screw them in and it works. Um, that's wrong. They're relatively well built so you can be not gentle with them. They sit on my floor. Um, make great, great well built products and their support's really good. Um, right now I have one sitting that turns on a fan and also turns on, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, when the temperature gets too hot, it, it, you know, 27 degrees, I can flip the fan on, it cools off my fish tank and my fish don't die from that. <laughs> also, since well, you have your, all your pet stuff is in one place, I have a pet feeder. Thought it was a great idea when I first got it because well, I was going on vacation for like a, a week and I wanted my cats to have food. And well, I got that thing and it was all right. It worked for a while and then said, er, more than it fed my cats. It was 50 bucks, so it wasn't too much out of it, but hey, it had the, elect it, the electronics sucked, but the parts actually worked relatively well. So I kind of ripped them out. They kind of went to the trash. And my cats are fed by a cron job. <laughs> yeah. It's a, the mod IO is just an I squared C device, a little I squared C program that writes out, turn on that relay, turn off, wait 60 seconds while it takes to chug through, and then turn it off and then clear. And then, well, my cat actually responds to nom nom nom, which we taught her and it's adorable. But yeah, that's kind of. <clears throat> that. All right. <clears throat> so, with any project, you have lots of room for improvement. Uh, you never finish things, and my wife is one of those people that. <coughs> bless you. My wife loves me for it and also hates me for it that ne things are never together, and there's always a pile of wires. Um, I found I have a wife that is actually relatively happy with me, so I'm, I'm okay with this. Um, there are more ideas to this because I, I have all this power to do things, and I can't. You know, I have ideas and not enough time. Mood lighting. I mean, you, you turn your fish tank off at night, and you, you if it's the, sun, the moon's out, you usually like in the wild. It's you know pretty waves and pretty blue lights that flicker and stuff. I want to do that. Fish feeder. I want to be able to feed my fish as well as my cats. I don't think my cats like fish, or my cats like fish food, or my fish like cat food. But hey, um, more relays. Which the new, I just got that. I that one that's floating around. I just got that a couple days ago, and I'm gonna do that to turn on the lights and the heater for when it gets cold. Underwater camera would be kind of cool. I'd like to see my fish. Um, yeah. So that's cats. That's my cat. That's one of my cats. That's the one that responds to nom nom nom. She's adorable. Next. She likes the fish. And there's Tiggy on the top and Buttercup on the bottom, who are very friendly and cuddly and they love me. So this is the time where I open to questions because ARM is definitely one of those things that people don't know a lot about. I fully accept that and I'm, I understand that. So <clears throat> questions. Who has, an Ar who has a project that didn't work, working with an Arduino at all? You. Maybe you put control? Um, so would you do this? What, I didn't actually go to your talk. What, I didn't go to that talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you take what you, you have this $30 thing that were great, you know, a few years ago that were, you can do all these things with, and you find that you're, oh, you're kind of limited, and you're still plugging it into a computer, you're still working with it, like, well, cut out the middleman and do it all right there. You said you had a, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, it has a, you know, the Raspberry Pi, like all these things have full Linux capability. They have uh, Arch Linux ARM chips with Perl in it, uh, Python, Python 3, um, C, C++, plus plus, they all, it all compiles, it all works great. Um, you have full access to your I2C, SPI, GPIO, the whole gamut of things. Um, some, of the, the, some of the new stuff, like the, uh, B, the new BeagleBone Black, it actually has two separate controllers on it that can actually do, are their little eight, like 400 megahertz, they're called PRUs, programmable PLUs, I don't know. But you can program them to do things like protocol translation, like you have some weird protocol that you're getting from, you figured out your, your thermostat spits out this weird protocol stream over one of the pins, like, oh, well, I can figure that out. You don't want to have to tie up your CPU by doing I.O. waits to, you know, wait for the clocks. So you just have this little chip on it that apprehends that and then say, hey, I have data. I'm going to throw it there. And really kind of cool. You. Um, you can do either. Um, compiling on the, uh, natively on the device has its benefits and also its drawbacks. The biggest drawback is speed. Um, your ARM device is not going to be as fast as your desktop computer. Um, there's no question about it. You can compile a kernel on your computer in, you know, 10 minutes, whereas if you compile a kernel on your Raspberry Pi, it's going to take a couple hours. So you have that. Cross-compiling, though, can sometimes be weird with libraries, um, if you're trying to link something against something else, the libraries don't match up, and it just ends up with being a, a total mess. Um, so I tend, if you have the option to start, you know, if it's a small project, just compile it on your device. If it's something big, like you're trying to compile KDE, um, you have problems, um, but you can do it. Um, but, I mean, I would recommend, you know, doing a cross-compile, or um, another option would be a disk CC to offload a lot of your compile time and do the linking natively on the device, but offload all your compiles to another higher com performance computer. That answer, yeah? Um, so, how is stability like on one of these boards? Uh, like, let's say, for instance, I wanted to put it in a box, put a solar power battery on it, and leave it in the middle of the building for a year. It would work. How, how uh, reliable is the system to run and give it the correct heat management? Correct heat management and stuff like that? Um, you can, this, device here was actually sitting on my desk um, untouched for 92 days uptime. Um, I've had some, I had one device that was uh, 402 days before I sh restarted it. Um, I mean, they can get great uptime because they have, you know, great power management. If, as long as you don't lose power, you're going to stay. Um, things you have to keep in mind, though, are a lot of these have flash-based storage. So you're not going to be able to write a lot of things to it. Uh, you have a, you know, if you're writing to an SD card and you're logging everything to an SD card over and over and over again, you're going to wear out your write, your write cycle is going to go to nothing. And then you're going to end up with a dead card. You won't know it. Um, you can also, uh, some, some devices have uh, watchdogs on them. So if they lock up, they'll just restart. Um, you can do read-only operating systems for your root and then just offload your data somewhere else. Um, they all have USB, so you can actually just, I had one of these. No, that was some other pocket. Um, little, um, like 4G plug-in, you just plug it in and you have access to it wherever, whenever. Um, but once you, have a st once you have something stable and working, as long as you have it, it works great. Um, and actually, this device here actually has a lithium ion battery connector and charge circuit. Um, so as you plug it in, it'll run for 
a couple hours off a decent lithium ion battery, plug it in, it charges back up again. Most, most devices have, um, especially the stuff that's on the board itself, are going to be Linux device drivers that um, you're going to have your general I squared C, your SPI. Those are all going to be pretty standard. Um, program them as just like you would program for any SPI or I, I squared C device. Um, for the mod IO, you import or you uh, include IO.h, I think, or, S, or I squared C.h. And you just start talking to it through the I squared C library. And, um, make sure I, I2C dev is a module, and you can just point it to slash dev slash I squared C dash zero and go at it. Um, other random things, you can find weird things on some, um, like the, the little side processor on the Beagle Bones does have its own special little programming languages and stuff like that. Um, that's a little bit more intense and difficult, but it can be done. Um, it just pretty much it acts as a piece of memory in your kernel space and say, hey, do something to this and return it, whatever, and when it gets done, and you can do it. Um, other, uh, a lot of the devices, or a lot of companies are also doing Python libraries for your I.O. and stuff. Um, the Beagle, like the BeagleBone does have a, um, Pi BBIO, I think it's the package name uh, for BeagleBone IO for Python. Um, pretty easy to work with overall, yeah. Did you have any projects that you were thinking of? Or? Okay. So, you, um, so you're, it's an Arduino-based device. I've, I, I think I've seen a bunch of those before. Um, they are. I'm not going to move. I'm stay very still. Um, you can do that, like with that I/O board. It has the relays on it to trigger that. Um, you can put a web server on it. You can. Do whatever you want. It's, this board here has Wi-Fi on it, so you have you don't need to run wires to it. Um, uh, stay. Um, how, and you say so you have eight zones currently. Yeah. Um, those boards there are cascadable. Yeah. You just have to reassign a, a unique ID number to it. Uh, I'm talking about the one that I passed. I'm talking about this one here. Um, it's just I squared C, you send a command to it, and there's a button on here that says reset or something. So you push, you push button one while powering it on, it goes into a program mode, and you say, hey, I want you to be this address, and you can trigger that. You can also, um, the mod IO one has some GPIO that you can use. Um, this one has some analog in, I believe. Um, one of these has analog input, so you can actually measure soil, soil uh, dampness right then and there and have it do, like, hey, this soil is way too dry. I'm going to say, send you an email saying, hey, I need, the soil is dry. I need to water. It's like, okay, cool. You can, say, re, you can reply to it and say, water away. And things you can do more than you can do with an Arduino. Anything else? Anyone have any projects that they're thinking of doing? You look like you're thinking. You don't think? No. Oh, okay. I don't either sometimes. Sure. Are you local or? I'm actually from Delaware. Um, we, drove, we drove in this morning. Are you a, a 
Um, I, there, unfortunately, there's actually no good hacker spaces near me. I think the closest one that's like two hours, like an hour and a half away, which makes for not much fun to drive. Um, I do spend a lot of time with uh, the uh, Arch Linux ARM community on IRC and the forums. Um, so if you have any questions, track me down there. Um, I do a lot of, we do consulting, like if someone has a question like, hey, I want to do this, we can say, okay, well, good luck, have fun. Or, hey, I want to do this. Oh, that's pretty easy, you just need this, 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 and then time and patience. A lot of them are doing a lot more with uh, AV, um, Ar or not Arduinos, but they're switch moving from Arduinos to uh, the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone, Panda boards, um, things that have a lot of GPIO and also have a lot of processing power. Um, it's one of those things that like the the right tool for the job. Um, if you know what you need to do, if you need to just control a couple things and that's it, well then the Raspberry Pi would probably be perfect for you. If you need to have 20 GPIOs and eight analog, IO, analog inputs, well, the Raspberry Pi is probably not your best bet. Um, you're probably best with like a BeagleBone then, because that actually has a whole bunch of stuff. Um, the OMX stuff it ha actually has little display, touchscreen displays that you can put a touchscreen display for say your water sprinkler, you can give it re zone reports. How much is the whole system? Um, the board itself is, I think 59 euros, whatever that ends up being. Um, display is about another 20, 25 euros. GPIOs are 15 euros. So whatever that ends up being in dollars, I'm not sure. Um, but in my opinion, they're over the top of the Raspberry Pi. I think they're worth it. Um, but it, like I said, right tool for the job. Yeah. Um, you can do that definitely. Um, you can either do the hack way of putting servos on your door and controlling them that way, which um, if you're, you're married, your wife probably would not approve of. Um, my wife definitely does not, would not let me do that, um, as nice as she is. I love you. Um, but you can get things like uh, Zigbee controls. Um, like they have Zigbee locks, Zigbee power switches, um, the X10 home automation stuff that you can find at garage sales. You can get those and the little plug-in adapters that just plugs in. Um, there's actually a package called Monad that allows you to talk to all the X10 home automation stuff um, and it works relatively well. Um, I haven't done any door locks, but that would be definitely be, I think it'd be feasible. If not, then you can always get a, like one of the actual pretty deadbolt ones and there's kind of run wires along the door jams here. It's pretty, and then go that route. Um, yeah, um, you can easily handle it. It can handle a lot more than that. Um, you can put a Wi-Fi adapter on there, so you can check the lock status of your doors. You can. Um, Unlock, you, you can use your cell phone to unlock it if you want then. So you can just, you know, go to a website, log in, hit the button, hey, I'm home, unlock. Or if you really not fun, you could have it ping your router, say, hey, is this, is this MAC address connected to my router? If it is, but it is, if it's newly registered, let's unlock the door because he's coming home. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once you it's only going to be there when you're there, unless you forget your phone. Uh, 
<laughs> I'm not saying it's, it's the safest thing in the world, but you, it's, you could e very easily do things like that. How big's your wallet? There's your, I mean, that's gonna be your biggest thing. Um, money, is all, <laughs> money is always the biggest thing, because you always end up with thinking, oh, I can do that, you know, it's 50 bucks for that, and maybe another 10 bucks for those other parts, and you know, some of these things. And then you don't realize, oh, I need that too, and that. Oh, now I wanna do that. Oh, and then you end up with triple your original plan, and, but yeah, you can do a lot of things. You can do um, the XB wireless modules. Um, they have uh, GPIO on there that you can talk to back and forth, and then just use your Raspberry Pi or Beagle as a home, home base. Um, you can really do, and it's, it's a computer. It's just not as powerful and doesn't use as much power. So anything you could do with a regular Linux computer, you can do here. Well, there's, I, I also have, uh, has anyone done, who's done stuff with an Arduino before? You, you, what have you done? Hands down, it's 10 times faster, 10 times easier to deal with, you know, a Raspberry Pi or else. Um, actually, I have a friend who actually works for an ERP company that um, is actually working on ERP controls in that run on an ARM-based device. So we can control the entire, like, industrial automation stuff. So we can go here. I want to shut down this factory line from this little control panel and goes through and does it all. They can't see it. They can't see what they do immediately. Like with a Raspberry Pi, you have a screen, you have a keyboard, you have a mouse. You can actually put a GUI on it that allows you to work on it and say, okay, well, that didn't work. Instead of having to unplug it, plug it back in your computer, recompile, re upload it, replug it back in, you just change it, enter. Oh, now it worked. And they can see things right away versus the Everything is, we're in a love-hate relationship with the Raspberry Pi. Um, the Raspberry Pi is not the best hardware in the world, but they got the marketing right. They got the price point for the chip right. They brought it to the masses properly, and they were expecting to sell like 10,000 units, but they've actually sold a million and going. You can't, you can't buy that, so it's, so it's bringing more people into, you know, if you would have thought, you know, four, four years ago, you'd been like, ARM, I have one of these. What, why do I need that? Because you don't think. Um, but it's brought it to so much, 
publicity. It's incredible. Um, I never thought that we'd have, you know, thousands of users, uh, you know, on a little tiny thing that started off with just a couple. And it just has taken off in the past couple years and amazing. What, what have you done with an Arduino? What have you done with an Arduino? Do uh, you just want to monitor that kind of stuff for your garden or? I do believe I've seen those. And I believe I'm going to switch to this. Another good starter track is called the Udu Transcend. Udu? Yeah. The, uh, the, yeah, the uh, Freescale IMX6 quad with the Atmega chip on it as well. Yep. That's kind of like the Tinkerer's dream board, I think, um, because it actually gives you the capability of an ARM or a, a full computer as well as all the capability of an Arduino um, with, with its easy to program capabilities. What's that? Maybe we'll find out. Yeah, I hope, has it been funded yet? Uh, it's funded, but that doesn't Yeah, it's actually, I've looked into it and I've thought it's really kind of cool. Um, there are cheaper alternatives. Um, there is the PC Duino, which is an all winner A10 based that has the same kind of pinouts that aren't quite pin compatible with all the shields and stuff, but it works with a lot of them. Um, and you can get for like 45 bucks, it's you know, 512 gig of RAM, gigabit, or uh, 10, 100 megabit Ethernet, USB, HDMI. But yeah, um, yeah, the Udu would probably be very good for, for what you're looking at, because um, it actually has a lot of capability in that case, um, allow you to take all your information and process right then and there, throw out, throw out errors, you know, do actually data analysis right then and there versus having to log with an Arduino, take it out, copy it over there, like, okay, I'm doing this wrong, now I go back and fix it, whereas it can alert you real time, like, hey, something's wrong, or, hey, this is working right, cool. Anyone else? Any ideas? Yeah. Actually, I was wondering about the, like, uh, was it the Beagle Bone that you were talking mm -hmm. about? The Beagle Bone. I know that um, the Raspberry Pis had a little problem with them, like a, a white phone and Bitcoin one that had like the little like the little bit of her like odd processor for the error that showed up out of nowhere that I didn't know what they had. So. Bitcoin mining on ARM processors? No. Um, the best you're going to get is some ARM processors have a FPGA on board as well that you can hand off a, a job to. Um, there's the Parallela, which has all those, I think it's this little dual core, one gigahertz ARM Xilinx or Zinc processor, and then has these all these little uh, 64, 64 like single core processors in it, which can do all kinds of things, but I've not really looked into it too much. Um, but you're not gonna get too much Bitcoin mining on anything that's low powered unless you heavily design something specific like I think a year or two ago, someone did, did that FPGA yeah. board. Yeah. ASIC, yeah. Yeah, you're not gonna get a lot of uh, performance out of it. I mean, Bitcoins are designed to be difficult to make because they need to be difficult to make. If they're going to be something you can chunk out a bunch of them all at once, they're gonna be kind of useless. So, yeah. You can dream, actually, you probably could wire a ATI graphics card to the PCI Express port on some of these ARM-based devices and go that route. Um, but yeah, 
you think, okay, well, if I can do it on the Raspberry. No, um, you're not going to get anywhere close to having the performance that you need to do that. It depends on, it depends on the distribution you use. Um, Raspbian comes with some stuff built in already. Um, I think the Occidentals from Adafruit has a bunch of stuff built in, like a, a web IDE, I believe. Um, Arch Linux ARM has pretty much the base install and SSH, and then you can do whatever you want. Um, I would probably avoid running Apache on them um, because Apache is kind of heavy. What's that? Um, maybe uh, Nginx and LightHTTP work great. Um, I had one running for months or for a couple of years actually uh, with Nginx and uh, PHP FPM handling you know some database backend stuff. And as long as there wasn't too much load, it can handle a lot of stuff. Um, don't expect a like your if you host your own. Blog, don't expect it to be. Yeah, you can do that. Actually, uh, I recently saw some uh, a Python project that had the web server was actually made, done in Python, and actually triggered triggered the GPIOs and stuff in that from that program itself. So it actually was all in one versus having to have a PHP backend link to s trigger something else. So you can do anything you want that you can do in a, you know, a computer. You can do in a, you know, a Raspberry Pi or Beagleone. It just won't be as fast or as responsive. Yeah. Um, you do have that, but once again, the right tool for the job. Um, if your company has people that have already done something very similar to that in another for another machine, it doesn't oh, from, from scratch. Well, um, if they're are they writing their own software already? Huh? Are they writing their own software? Um, you see that a lot in industrial automations. You'll see a, a lot of stuff moving to more simple platforms um, like ARM, MIPS, uh, some PowerPC, you know, small, low powered computing because they don't need it. Um, some places, uh, you'll, I so wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing Android in some of those because programming for Android is really easy. Um, you can hook up a you know, GPIOs to that. You write a program in Java that starts up automatically, and if it crashes, it just restarts. Um, and you can you know, get anyone that's graduated college now to do that for you, um, for a simple one. Um, but if you need to write something more complex and completely by yourself, and the person you have 
that does it is a Windows programmer that's been doing this for years. It makes sense to stick with what they know. I mean, you really can't, you can, you can push them to do, you can suggest things, but you can't push them to do anything. Anything else? I have a vast knowledge of things. You just have an inquisitive face. Yeah, oh, okay. I like <laughs> paying attention to my static. Um, so like, I've done all kinds of things. I have a, when I go away for vacation, I actually take a bunch of ARM-based devices, strew them through my apartment with wireless cards in them and webcams, and I actually have a cat cam, because I like my cats. I mean, it's simple things like that you can do, but you, you, you want to watch your cat while you're gone. Throw up a webcam and go, and it uses three watts of electricity at all times and never peaks above that. You're going to sit there, and you, it's a, like $2 a month, if that, whereas you hook up an old Pentium server, or P old Pentium computer that you had, that's going to cost you, you know, 25 30 bucks a month just to sit in the closet and churn and do the same exact thing. What else, what else have we done? I have, uh, you know, logging information, like for the fish tank monitor, it's one of the one that actually sits there, actually doesn't record the data. It's actually just through, going through a SQL query and of course in a database that you can extract out of. Um, I mean, it's, it's amazing what you can do with such little things. Again, I never thought that you know, it'd be so easy to interact with these things. It's kind of, I guess the best way to think of it is you used to have this, you know, back in the 80s and early 90s, you could actually go inside a computer and you could, you know, hook into the ISA bus and pull data directly off of that and actually interface with things. Nowadays, you can't do anything close to that. The best you have is plugging an Arduino into the USB port and going that route. Um, but these, you actually have access to the I.O., you have access to the SPI, I squared C, and you can do it. Um, it's not a huge learning curve. Like if you wanted to program for, you know, I7 right now, I don't even want to think about that. It's insane, but programming for these, the low-level stuff is there. You just Import it, you look at other things like, oh, I want to do that. You do it. Yeah. What's that? Um, actually, you can. Um, a lot of the higher end ones now are uh, Zigbee or XB or X-Wave or Z-Wave or one of those protocols that actually um, can talk to a base station and you can check the status of anything in there. Um, if you have an older system, um, you can, and you don't want to pay, you know, ADT, you know, the $35 a month or whatever, you can actually just rip this control panel off and use all the sensors that they have. Because um, my apartment, I, they offer a, the ability to have their security system, and if I, you know it's thirty bucks a month, I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't really need it. But if I wanted to, I could actually all the wires are there. I can just go from here to there, and the magnet sensors are there, the motion detectors there. You just interface with those directly. But I, I'm not. I don't know anyone that's actually done the Zigbee integration. That'd be kind of cool. Have you ever integrated it with a thermostat? Um, actually, that was one of my projects that I was working on um, because I wanted to be able to know when my thermostat was on, when it was off, because 
You don't know these things. Actually, the easiest way, to, in my opinion, to do that, to actually just monitor, is statistics. We can go back. All right, so you have all these peaks, and these are all drops when my air conditioning turns on. Turns off, turns on, turns off, turns on. You can actually just see how often my air conditioner turns on, when it was, and you can go that route. If you want to actually control it, you actually have, you have to go through and do that, but I was more afraid of freezing if I broke something, because I have a tendency to do that sometimes. Um, yeah, I think my wife would be very un unhappy if uh, she woke up and it was 40 degrees in the house. Um, What's that? Yes, um, there are actually uh, several op options with that. Um, your best option would be to go with a commercial product that has the interface to do it. Um, but I mean, it's as simple as a relay and a temperature sensor um, and controlling it. But that's one of those things that I that I wouldn't mess with my brakes in my car. Um, bungee cords, like I wouldn't want to measure the tension of bungee cord by putting something in the middle of it. Wouldn't be the brightest idea. Um, but yeah, make sure that you just know what you can do and how long it's going to take before you undertake these things. Because you know, if you want to do a thermostat project, you know, plan out what you need, how much it's going to cost. If it's going to take a month to fully implement, make sure that that month isn't going to be like freezing. Like do it in spring or fall, so you're not. If something breaks, you're not going to be in the doghouse. But yeah, make sure you know these things. Make sure that you, uh, the people that it's going to affect, also will appreciate it. Because. Yeah, if you break things, they don't like it. Um, but yeah, home automation can, is one of those things that can be definitely a trick that can be like, hey, honey, I can do this. It'll only cost X number of dollars. Well, that's kind of cool. Well, we could check on the cats. Like, really? Like, yes. So things that allow you to do that. It's, it's uh, finding the ways to spin these things to get them in the proper place. Questions? Well, we're roughly about time. Well, I would like to thank you. Um, if you have any questions, we have a table over yonder in the back corner. Um, we have a lot of stuff sitting out that you can pick up, play with. You know, ask more questions if you, I'm more than willing to talk to you about any ideas that you have, um, if they're feasible, not feasible. Um, I've been pretty good at picking, helping people pick the right tool for the job. Um, but thank you very much. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive easier to implement, and easier to use. 
giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people. Uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. 
add on seeing a lemon for the clouds tag. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk-based systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.